used to used it. And what Mint gives in return is a natural image of this reality. And just as bourgeois ideology is defined by the abandonment of the name bourgeois, Mint is cons constituted by the loss of historical quality of things. In it, things lose the memory that they were once made. The world enters language as a dialectical relation between activities, between human actions. It comes out of myth as a harmonious display of essences. A conjuring trick has taken place. It has turned reality inside out. It has emptied it out of history and has filled it with nature. It has removed from things their human meaning so as to make them signify a human insignificance. The function of myth is to empty reality. It is literally a ceaseless flowing out, a hemorrhage, or perhaps an evaporation. In sort, a perceptible absence. It is now possible to complete the semiological definition of myth in a bourgeois society. Myth is depoliticized speech. One must naturally understand political in its deeper meaning as describing the whole of human relations in their real social structure, in their power of making the world. One must above all give an active value to the prefix D. Here it represents an operational movement. It permanently embodies a defaulting. In the case of the black soldier, for instance, what is got rid of is certainly not French imperiality. On the contrary, since what must be actualized is its presence. It is the contingent historical, in one world, fabricated quality of colonialism. Myth does not deny things, on the contrary, its function is to talk about them. Simply, it purifies them, it makes them innocent. It gives them a natural and eternal justification. It gives them a clarity, which is not that of an explanation, but that of a statement of fact. If I state the fact of French imperiality without explaining it, I am very near to finding that it is natural and goes without saying, I am reassured. In passing from history to nature, myth acts economically. It abolishes the complexity of human acts. It gives them a simplicity of essences. It does away with all dialectics. With any going back beyond what is immediately visible, it organizes a world which is without contradictions because it is without depth. A world wide open and wallowing in the evident, it establishes a blissful clarity. Things appear to mean something by themselves. However, is myth always depoliticized speech? In other world, in other words, is reality always political? Is it enough to speak about a thing naturally for it to become mythical? What one could answer with Marx that the most natural object contains a political trace, however faint and diluted. The more or less memorable presence of a human act which has produced, fitted up, used, subjected or rejected it. The language object which speaks things can easily ex exhibit this trace. The metal language which speaks of things much less easily. Now myth always comes under the heading of metal language. The depoliticization which it carries out often supervenes against the background which is already naturalized, depoliticized by a general metal language which is trained to celebrate things and no longer to act them. It goes without saying that the force needed by myth to distort its object is much less in the case of a tree than in the case of a Sudanese. In the latter case, the political load is very near the surface. A large quantity of artificial nature is needed in order to dispense it. In the former case, it is remote, purified by a whole century-old layer of metal language. There are therefore strong myths and weak myths. In the former, the political quantum is immediate, the depoliticization is abrupt. In the latter, the political quality of the object has faded like a color. What is more natural than the sea? And what is more political than the sea celebrated by the makers of the film The Lost Continent? 
In fact, myth language constitutes a kind of preserve for myth. Men do not have with myth a relationship based on truth but on use. They depoliticize according to their needs. Some mythical objects are left dormant for a time. They are then no more than vague mythical schema though, whose political load seems almost neutral. But this indicates only that their situation had brought, has brought this about, not that their structure is different. This is the case with our Latin grammar example. We must note that here mythical speech works on a material which has long been transformed. The sentence by Essen belongs to literature. It is at the very start mythified, therefore made innocent, by its being fiction. But it is enough to replace the initial term of the chain, for instance, into its nature as a language object to gauge the emptying of reality operated by myth. Can one imagine the feelings of a real society of animals on finding itself transformed into a grammar example, into a predicated nature? In order to gauge the political load of an object and the mythical hollow which espouses it, one must never look at things from the point of view of the signification, but from that of the signifier of the thing which has been robbed. And within the signifier, from the point of view of the language object, that is, of meaning. There is no doubt that if we consulted a real lion, he would maintain that the grammar example is a strongly depoliticized state. He would qualify as fully political, the jurisprudence, which leads him to play the prey because he is the strongest. Unless we deal with the bourgeois lion, we would not fail to mythify his strength by giving it the form of duty. One can clearly see that in this case the political significance of the myth comes from its situation. Myth, as we know, is a value, is enough to modify circumstances, the general and precarious system in which it occurs, in order to regulate its scope with great accuracy. The field of myth is in this case reduced to a second form of a frenzy say, but I suppose that a child enthralled by the story of the lion, the heifer and the cow, and recovering enough through the life of the imagination, the actual reality of the animals, would appreciate with much less unconcern than we do the disappearance of this lion changed into a predicate. In fact, we hold this myth to be politically insignificant only because it is not meant for us.
as yet only one possible choice, and this choice can bear only on two equally extreme methods. I deposit a reality which is entirely permeable to history and ideologize, or conversely to deposit a reality which is ultimately impenetrable, irreducible, and in this case, poetize. In a word, I do not yet see a synthesis between ideology and poetry. By poetry, I understand in a very general way the search for the inalienable meaning of things. The fact that we cannot manage to achieve more than an unstable grasp of reality doubtless gives a measure of our present alienation. We constantly drift between the object and its demystification, powerless to render its fullness. For if we penetrate the object, we liberate it, but we destroy it. And if we acknowledge its full weight, we respect it, but we restore it to a state which is still mystified. It would seem that we are condemned for some time yet, always to speak excessively about reality. This is probably because ideologism and its opposite are types of behavior which are still magical.